Good afternoon, Steve Stricker here for RTC TV4, and this afternoon I'm up in Argus, and we've got a special event, and I'm going to let uh, my special guest here, Sue Irwin, tell us a little bit about what we're up here doing today. Well, Argus has a, a, a storied history in stonework. There was a gentleman um, doing stonework in Argus about the turn of the last century, approximately between 1900 and 1940 or so. His name was William Lake Foker, and um, he just did a beautiful job with stonework. He was really a stone artist, and we just a lot of his work is, is centered in Argus, and we just decided it was time for Argus to get um, their due in that regard. So we're going to be going around. We have the blueberry trams here today, and we've got some uh, area folks that are hooking up trucks behind us that are going to be taking folks around and uh, just going to be going around doing a little tour, right? Right. We're just going to uh, highlight some of the Foker porches and chimneys, um, and in some cases foundations, some things that Mr. Foker put together in his lifetime. Um, and they're really massive works of art. M many of the homes are bungalow style homes and they have porches that go almost all the way across the house. Um, but he just had a way with color and with style and with, um, with the cut of the stone. One of the things that was remarkable about uh, William Folker was that he used very little mortar between the stones. He just had a way of uh, putting them together, t fitting them so tightly that little mortar was needed. So lots of, sometimes he put um, um, designs in the chimneys. Uh, he had something he called the Star of uh, Hope, and he had the Wheel of Life, and he put those in the, in the chimneys many times and was just very good with color and cut. He did two types of stonework. One was cut stone, and the other was, was uh, co cobblestone. So some of the, some of the porches are, are cobblestone, uh, and some of them are cut stone. Okay, so we're going to uh, be taking the camera and going around with the tram. Um, how many uh, approximately different uh, sites do we have today? I believe we have 16 Foker homes that we're going to, to talk about today. On some of those, uh, we'll be able to get a close-up, you know, get off the trams and take a closer look at the porches and, and chimneys. Some we won't be able to do that. All right, it's, uh, you know, something that I've always been, you know, historically very interested in history and stuff and growing up in the area I've I've noticed the work but this is the first time that really you know put the background to it so uh, looks like you're filling up you got a pretty good crowd coming in here we still got a little bit to go before the thing starts so uh, looks like we're getting a good turnout I believe we're gonna have a wonderful turnout and the weather looks like it's gonna cooperate so we're just good to go I, I'm trusting that everything's gonna go according to plan all right, so we'll uh, take a break. We'll come back and uh, we'll be on the tram and we'll go around and check out some of the uh, works of William Lake Foker in just a moment. Thank you. So William Foker was an English immigrant born in Plymouth on April 22nd of 1857. He has moved around a lot as a child and he moved to Argus in 1882. Uh, he started his career actually as a bricklayer and a plasterer and watched many uh, stonemasons in that process and developed a love for laying field stone. He married uh, Argus native Mary Jane Nip in 1882. She passed away in 1935. He then married Nancy Jane Young in 1936. Um, and in, through his 20s, actually, his entire 20 uh, year, the decade, he worked as a bricklayer and a uh, plasterer. They had one adop adopted child, Edna, and they adopted her in 1902. William Foker died uh, in 1942. He was 85 years old. Uh, he is buried in Maple Grove Cemetery, which we will visit. It'll be our last stop today and he has a very interesting uh, story about his headstone. There were um, several Masons in Marshall County at the time and they were really the uh, impetus for a lot of growth and development across Marshall County developing and building new homes. Um, actually many of them were trained by Foker in his later years and when he when the Isaac Walton Clubhouse was built, he was actually unable to work on it and became a supervisor, training his apprentices 
and they laid the stone that is now the Isaac Walton Clubhouse. He was described as a very tall, raw-boned Irishman with a sense of humor, excuse me, and an artist's eye. He was very well read, he enjoyed reading, and uh, was actually a pro prolific reader and loved art. According to his daughter Edna, Foker had a period in his life where he drank very heavily and he overindulged. He actually gave it up and put a bottle of whiskey on his mantle in his home to remind him to never imbibe again. He read many articles about stone cutters and European stone cutters. Stone cutters. He worked. Uh, he actually went to South Bend for a period of time and spent several months in South Bend working on a project in South Bend, which I think we know now as the, we believe it to be the Oliver Mansion, although we're not sure. Um, some folks said he was working at Notre Dame, and some folks said he might have been working on another home in that area. But we believe that he was uh, working on the Oliver Mansion at the time, learning his trade before he came back here. He did a number of barns in this area. He started out with really barns and housing foundations before he developed moving into the house, uh, houses and the stonework with the walls and the fireplaces and porches. First house. Yep, this is our first house. The one with the flat? With the flat. Yeah, both of, okay, both of these homes are William Foker homes. Well, you can get off at this point if you want to look at these houses. No, this is the home of Rachel Boffman. This house was built in 1919 for the James Sanderson family, one of the original owners of the Argus Lumber Company. Yep, we can get off and look here. So this was built for the James Sanderson family. They had a daughter, Eileen, who tells a story that they actually went out and she remembers collecting the stone for these homes, or for this home. There's a couple of traits I'd like for you guys to think about when you look at these homes today. William Foker was known for not having large mortar lines. So he really laid the work out so that he would minimize the uh, lines between the mortar, for the mortar. He also was known for making pillar-style rock pile corners that would be native to a person just stacking stone up out in a field. A couple of other traits that I want you to think about today as we look at these homes. He was really into symmetry and color. He loved to incorporate black stones in his work and offset them with color. And he also liked to create some symmetry in stones that he split. And we'll see some better examples of that later today. One other thing that I'm gonna make note of for you guys to look at, and I don't believe there's one in either one of these houses, but the next one, he was also known, and he liked to put what we call a pudding stone in one of the uh, articles that he built. And a pudding stone essentially looks like white granite, but it has flakes of jasper in it and he would call that a pudding stone. Um, so you're more than welcome to go up and look at these homes. Why, why are these black? These stones are black. <clears throat> so he, he, would, he did both styles of just natural stonework, which would be on your right, and then he did styles where he would cut them. Yep, he was known also for cutting a lot of his stones without the use of fire although he did at times use fire to heat the rock. Many times, as we understand it, he had an eye for looking at rocks, being able to crack them and get the desired look that he wanted. I want to remind you, these homes were the early 1900s. There were no skid loaders. There were no power saws. There was not a power mixer mixing mortar. So we believe, from what we've read, that many of these stones have come from just north of Argus, between 15th and 14th Road. Actually, some of them, I think we know now, probably came north of 14th Road in a big field that's uh, farmed now by the Huyen family. But, uh, and I used to pick rocks in that field when I was a kid. Uh, there's a lot there.
um, and probably hauled into town here where he would work with them. So it's very important to note. So many of these stones were probably hauled by horse and or early uh, vehicle or trucks that were available in the day. How do you split them with fire? I don't understand that. They heat them and it just expands oh, okay. the, and they are able to crack them that way. Many folks still do it that way today. You know, across from Notre Dame, there's, some, there's a women's college and they have the big fence there with the flat field stone and the raised grout. Did he do that? We, we don't know. We don't have no documentation of that. We know he's done the, a lot of homes here in Argus. We're only going to visit a few of them. Uh, we know there's probably some homes on the South Michigan Street, Street in Plymouth that were done by him. There are some homes in Lighters Ford, Rochester that we know have been done by him. But most of his work was done right here in the immediate uh, Argus area. So this home was the James Sanders family, the original owner, built in 1919. They owned the Argus Lumber Company at the time. This is very important because the uh, National Hardware Association at that time was located here in Argus. So he became kind of an impetus to help develop and grow and use lumber and develop the trade in this area. As I said, his daughter Eileen remembers collecting rocks every Sunday, hauling them to this area. Um, so yeah, this is uncut cobblestone porch and chimney. He also did the interior of this fireplace. Um, a beautiful home. Eileen Sanderson and Kevin Free eventually sold the house to Glenn and Sarah McKee Wolf. Okay, the house on the left is owned by Rhonda Davis. I think Rhonda is actually here. Um, this is one of the many uh, uh, roomy bungalow, craftsman bungalow looking houses that were built between 1910 and 1920 here in Argus. Large, expansive Folker chimney, porch, fireplace, appealed to the taste of many executives with the National Retail Hardware Association, which actually had many of the executives moving to Argus at that time. Um, uh, Mr. Corey was actually the, the uh, builder of this house. He was the founder of the Hardware Association. He died in 1919. The association then moved its headquarters to Indianapolis in 1924. Um, John Grolick family owned this house for many years in the 70s and 80s. But if you want to look, I can show you some features that are very prominent with Folker work. So he was also famous for putting the water drain in. We'll see a couple of homes like this on the tour. And not in this home, he used a very symmetrical design in this home, but some of the homes he has a patterned arch above that. You can see the black rock offset with many different colors, the very thin mortar lines. Um, this house does not have a pudding stone in it, I don't believe. This, it's a white quartz rock with red jasper flakes in it that he called a pudding stone. You can see here some of the granite formation developed uh, by glaciers. And the fireplace is uh, spectacular. So there is a pudding stone in this home. There's actually a couple in this home. You can probably see them from there. Also, this home, you can see that the mortar lines stick out. It was remortared later on. That was not a feature of w William Foker. The next home is uh, owned by Dylan and Letitia Colburn. It's this home here. It has a round front porch on it. This was a Victorian era house, and it received what we call a Foker facelift, who added this porch Later on, as you notice, he decided not to put on a square porch. He put on a round porch. Um, so he didn't stick with the uh, bungalow style thing traditionally and added that beautiful porch. 
This next home is owned by Gene and Vi Ward. Stop. This says that raised ground too. Was this redone? Uh, yes, this house was redone. So there's a little bit of history about this house. This was uh, this house was constructed in 1902 as a Dutch colonial revival style house. It locks. We actually lock, lack the uh, documentation that Foker did this stonework, but we believe in our hearts that he did, based on what we see up and down this road. Striking details are, resemble all the other houses. You also notice when we drive by, this chimney is only done halfway up. We don't know if that was because they ran out of money or if that's the effect that they were going for at the time. Maybe they ran out of rocks. We don't know for sure. But the artistry in this stonework is actually beautiful. Um, this home was built for Dr. Eugene Wilsey. He was a local dentist. Yes, so this house, this is a wonderful house. This, um, notice the drains, he put arched uh, over tops in this one. He also added the arched tops in all of the basement windows. And in this house they had a little different effect. He almost put the stone up as wainscoting around the home. Um, we believe Harry Conisac, uh built this and put this porch on and had Foker do all the work somewhere around 1918. Um, the, the, wind, the basement windows have suspended arches. Um, the, the natural drainage points of the front porch are um, natural. We have also been told that this stonework, they also incorporated Indian relics. And if you really, like some of the home, homeowners in the past have told us, if you really go through and look at a lot of the stonework, you may see tomahawk or arrowhead pieces incorporated into the stonework of the home. Um, Clarence Reed, the Halls family, Doc Middleton and his family all lived in this house. Doc Middleton was a dentist that actually had a practice up here above the, the bank for many, many years. But they all lived in this home at one time. This is a Craftsman bungalow style home. It was built in 1915 for Harry Alleman using uncut field stone for the chimney and the porch. A stone mantle is actually topping the fireplace in this home and matches the trim to the porch railing that you see. The pointed stones on the top of the chimney are, are another detail that came on in later life for Foker. Yeah, we can get out here and actually look if you want. Foker's brother-in-law, Bill Sissel, worked with him much of the time, including on this house. Uh, unique to the house is a garage that was built under the house at that time. It was large enough for a 1915 automobile at that time, but a car no bigger. So this uh, unique home was built for Glenn Warner Sr., we believe in somewhere around 1920, 23. Uh, the stone masonry work in this house, though, was actually done by another stone mason, Harmon Lofma, and he was uh, under the direction of William Foker at the time as an apprentice. This Craftsman bungalow features a, a real oriental influence in its roof lines and its wide overhanging eaves. The story is that Mr. Warner made his living raising and selling horses. And after a trip to California, he came home and he wanted to build a house that would resemble some of the things he had seen in California. And this was the home that was built. Um, William Foker's best stack rock design, we believe, is in this home. Having stones placed very close together, minimizing mortar, and with more and more massive boulders at the bottom. And increasingly smaller stones tapered towards the top that supports uh, all the other stones. And again, you'll notice the, t the chimney top with the cracked pointed rocks across the top mm -hmm. and the uh, naturally formed rock drainage in the uh, front porch. And he actually used the rock as a drainage rock. You can see there protruding from the front of the house. 
Um, a former Argus resident who grew up in this neighborhood recalls playing hide the penny in this porch. <laughs> she commented, I knew every rock and touched every rock on that, that porch at one time or another. The Seiler family lived um, in this home for some time after the Warners, and they sold the house in early 1950 to the Vanderwill family, Bruce and Viv Vanderwill. And they still own the, this home is still with the Vanderwill family. Um, it is not known where, a, it is not known if Harmon Loma did the heavy lifting on this project uh, because we do know that William Foker began to suffer from sciatic rheumatism as time grew on. So we're thinking that that's why he had the apprentice maybe do a lot of the heavy lifting on this particular project. So you've been in the house. Oh, yeah. So the next home we're going to see we consider to be the crown jewel of William Foker. Before we get there, I'll tell you a little history about this home. Um, I, and I, I would encourage everyone to get out and maybe take a look at this home if you can. It's the Dorsey home, just around the corner. And this home was built uh, by Foker for his own family and his own residence. He began planning construction of this home in 1912, but it was nearly five years later before they could move in. Once it was completed, it turned out to be too much upkeep for his wife, and they only lived there for a very short period of time. Um, he gathered stones for his own home, supposedly across northern Indiana. So they specifically didn't all come from uh, the Argus, Marshall County area. He actually had an eye for rock and he would find a piece that he wanted in his own home and haul it back here. Um, some consider this, this stone we're going to look at to be his crowning achievement. The stones are many and varied and the whole house is constructed without any two similar stones ever touching one another. One of the features of the home will be that the chimney is in two halves and are all of stone placed opposite of each other. I'll show you that when we get there, creating a symmetry you'll see in um, a lot of the work. Before we get over there and we look at it, I want to let you know too, it was at this time that he started uh, trying to incorporate more artistry in his work and we're going to see something that he trademarked as the wheel of life. He would call it the wheel of life or the star of hope that he incorporate, started to incorporate into a lot of his stonework. The Dorsey family currently lives in this home. They have lived here since 1980 in this home. Um, Raymond Ryan, oh also Bill Egbeer and Lex Clark families also lived in this home. Um, at one time it was rented to an individual called Neil Thompson. There's some unique features I would like to show you in this home. Notice the cut pieces set on edge much like he did around the top of the chimney. He did it on his front porch also. He did incorporate sedimentary rocks into this home. There are some really unique features around on the chimney I would like to show you. So this particular stone, this is what they refer to as the wheel of life. If you look up above, you'll see the big red stone. Oh, okay. Again, so this is what we would consider to be the wheel of life. If you go on up above, see the big red stone in the center? Right above that, you'll see a star with white stone. And then if you look above that, to the right, you'll see a white stone. It's kind of hard to see today, but that resembles an eagle. And you can actually see like a little beak that he made with a piece of black stone on the side. Actually, in the sunlight, when it's bright out and the light's hitting it, it's, it's pretty easy to see, actually. It's very hard to see today because of the, the lighting's a little off on it. But extraordinary work here. You can see these were probably the same rock, split, and he made them uh, symmetrical to one another. Peace, 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 peace. Second. 
So the next house here is on the left. This is uh, Denise DeVoe's home. This is a nice, neat, little tidy home. Shows off Falker stonework and all of its advantages. Um, it was, we believe this to be one of the earlier built focal homes in 1910 and it was built for John Boston Stevenson. The fireplace, chimney and porch were all set cobblestone style rocks gathered here by area farmers. Boston and Madison Stevenson, that might be a name that uh, some of you remember, he at one point owned the grocery store uptown, collected these stones themselves and they reported that farmers were quite glad to be gone of the bothersome rocks. Foker only picked certain rocks though from the piles of rocks they brought up. He only wanted certain rocks to incorporate into his home. Um, this house was later owners was Mary Castleman and she comments to this day that Foker fireplaces do not create backdraft. So they do not smoke inside the home at all. It's never been an issue. That was the first report we had of that. This stone, this particular home in my mind, the, the corner pillars are even exaggerated to add a little accent rather than being very symmetrical to a point. He's actually created a bit of an arch mm -hmm in these pieces of stonework. Um, this stone in the inside has a beautiful cut stone fireplace. Um, the, phone, the stones in the fireplace are symmetrical. Um, it was built in 1920, well into Foker's career. Um, and it truly shows that he is perfecting his craft as you go along and look, to, look at these. Has very good color variations, closely tight fit stones. Um, former owners are Stacy Carpenter and son Gerald's family. It was sold into Walt and Bev Beam Barrett in 1976. And this house up here is another Foker's front porch that was added. Um, the, f the former owners of that home were the owners of the Argus Reflector. The Argus Reflector, for those that you don't know, used to be the Argus newspaper. Okay, uh, It was built for Cora and John Wickheiser in a bungalow style right around 1912 also. The beautiful stone-cut porch um, is actually accented by a unique slate floor. So the floor in that front porch is actually slate and there are pieces of mosaic tile incorporated into it. It, it does have noted pudding stones on it also. Um, William Frost currently owns the house and he rents it. It's, it's a rental property here in Argus. Former owners of the home include the Ledford family and Mick and Judy Hooker but that's very reminiscent of a Foker uh, front porch and uh, the Foker stonework. Okay. <laughs> so, b before we get to the cemetery, I'll give you a little history. At the age of 85, in 1942, Foker completed his final project on a fireplace and a chimney in Tyner for Judge Harvey Curtis. He cut the stones but allowed another mason to put them into place at his direction. Foker died in September the 3rd of 1942, so he passed away shortly after finishing that project. He is buried at Maple Grove Cemetery where we are going to go next. Uh, with his wife, she died in 1935. Long before his death, Foker found an enormous boulder. And he wanted that boulder as his grave marker well before his death. So they hauled it back here and kept it for him until he passed away. He carved the name Foker on its face and he and his wife rest under this monument. Unconcerned about competition, he trained another, he trained many other stonemasons over the course of his career. Chief among his protégés was his brother-in-law, William Sissel, who is buried here with him, who traveled and worked with Mr. Foker for many years. Foker also worked with local stonemason David Loma, which I mentioned earlier, and his seven sons. 
Clement Howard and Louis Swihart are two more local statesmen, uh, stoneman masons, excuse me, two more local stone masons <laughs> who were contemporaries and trained under William Foker. This is the only rock headstone in this cemetery. And he found this rock way before his death said that is the most beautiful stone I have ever seen. I want that to be my headstone. Mm -hmm. They brought it back to Argus, kept it somewhere until his death. I wouldn't accuse it of being What's the panel like thing on it? Looks like it had a panel on it. It probably had a plaque on it at one point. Now as you look at this rock on this headstone, think back when they're building these houses, this could have been a rock that he split and incorporated pieces into homes here in Argus. They were probably that big, many of them, that he split to incorporate and to do his work. And why he thought this was his most beautiful stone he'd ever seen, I have no idea. But that is the quote that he gave, is that's the most beautiful stone I've ever seen.